with that said, it's 602. I see 12 attendees and 12 panelists. So uh, uh, we could end up with some, some more folks joining us, uh, but I'd like to go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us on uh, September the 8th for the Bonanza Solar Project public information se uh, session on the variance process for this uh, solar project. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, uh, please. For you this evening, the agenda is, this is a Zoom webinar hosted by DUDEC and presented by the Bureau, <coughs> the Bureau of Land Management. This meeting is scheduled from six to eight. We will be here until eight this evening. Uh, we will give you a BLM presentation and opportunity for questions and answers uh, in the Q&A. Uh, Amy says, I can't understand you. Uh, could um, Jonathan, could you communicate with Amy to see if uh, there's some uh, buttons that could be uh, adjusted just so that uh, that Amy can participate? Yeah, I'll, I'll Amy, I'm going to um, chat to you um, in the directly in the chat box. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, and then we'll have a public input session. During the public input session, we'll not be answering uh, any of the public input. You'll have two minutes to give us your public input on that if you run out of time you're more than welcome to have a, a another opportunity after others uh, have had some opportunity uh, please be respectful to all parties on this call that is uh, that is uh, highly important uh, so introductions um, first the blm i'm greg helseth i'm a branch chief in the renewable energy office at the nevada state office uh, with us today uh, that we have from the blm uh, first would be uh, Angie Bullets. She's our district manager in Southern Nevada. Uh, with us also, we have um, Shauna Duman. She's the Las Vegas field manager in Southern Nevada. And uh, Steve Leslie is uh, an assistant field manager uh, for the Las Vegas field office uh, from the Southern Nevada district. Uh, we also have with us Mark Slaughter. He is a uh, supervisory uh, biologist also with the Southern Nevada district. We also have uh, with us uh, Quinn May. She's our realty specialist here at the Nevada State Office on the renewable energy team. Uh, we have Tim Vandervoort with us this evening. He is our archeologist on the, the renewable energy team. And then we also have uh, Brian Bazzani out there. I don't know, did we lose? Brian, where does Brian's icon? So Brian is out there somewhere, and uh, and uh, I see him on the thing there. So oh, there's Brian. So he's our uh, planning and environmental coordinator, uh, also on the Nevada Renewable Energy Team. Uh, so EDF, could you introduce yourselves, please? Yes, I am. Um, I'm Levi Cox. I'm the uh, project developer, project manager for the Bonanza Solar Project. And hi, my name is Devin Muto. I'm a senior development director for EDF Renewables in our West region. I oversee our solar development in Nevada and California. And I realize I've missed a very important person from Southern Nevada. That would be Kirsten Cannon. She's a public affairs officer. Uh, I'd be in trouble if I didn't make sure I mentioned her also. So I believe I've got everybody covered from the BLM and EDF uh, for us. Uh, and then uh, we have uh, from DUDAC, we have Jonathan Rigg uh, running the, the Zoom uh, for us this evening. If we go to the next slide, please. So this is the variance workflow process slide. It, it'll, it'll be, it's, a, it's animated. So first we're gonna talk a little bit about the solar programmatic environmental impact statement from 2012 that designated solar energy zones. It also created variance areas, solar projects considered on a case-by-case -case uh, case -case basis, and it also uh, it provided us with exclusion areas. Uh, if somebody wants to apply for a variance area, they, they do so by a standard form 299 and a plan of development submitted to the BLM. They go through a variance evaluation and then they end up uh, in uh, public and uh, tribal agency input, which is where we're at right now. Uh, 
And then uh, from there, it goes to the Nevada State Director. And then from the Nevada State uh, Director, who would make a decision uh, recommending to the BLM Director. And then the BLM Director makes the final determination whether to accept or reject the application. So that's a little bit of the workflow process of the variance process. What I'd like to speak to you now is what the variance process is not. It's not a major federal action under the National Environmental Protection Act. It's not an undertaking. So there's, there's under the National Historic Preservation Act and it does not trigger compliance with the Endangered Species Act. It's a high level overview. If we could go to the next slide, please. In the next slides, six, seven, and eight, I'm bringing on uh, Levi to uh, uh, address the uh, audience here about EDF renewables. Uh, Levi, could you please uh, take over those slides? Yep, thank you, Greg. So EDF Renewables, for those that aren't familiar with the company, EDF Renewables North America, it's one of the largest renewable energy developers in North America, uh, responsible for operating uh, developing 20 gigawatts of wind, solar, and storage throughout the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. It's, yep, it's, it's okay. It's significant, too, that EDF not only develops projects, but they also own and operate their projects as well. So ne next slide, please. This here kind of gives you an overview of where in the United States EDF has projects. Uh, the EDF development team for the West has developed over 30 plus utility scale projects uh, over the next three years, plan to construct over a thousand megawatts of uh, renewables and the pipeline through 2030 is over 10 gigawatts. And this includes projects and significant experience in Nevada, California, in the development of uh, the construction and operation of these projects. Next slide, please. And so the question is, why cite the solar here for the Bonanza Solar Project? Uh, there's a few different uh, things that come into play when we're looking for uh, siting projects. First is the land. This area has favorable uh, topography. It's relatively flat and it's uh, consistent uh, with the existing infrastructure. We've got the Highway 95 to the north. Uh, we've got transmission to the south and we've got additional planned uh, utility infrastructure coming in that area as well. Also too, everybody knows that lives in Southern Nevada, that the solar energy resource there is, is good. And so there's a, a good uh, net capacity factor for solar energy in that part of the state. And then also too, when we look at the transmission out here uh, for the project, uh, we see that the, the project site is in close proximity to the Valley Electric Association um, used to be, it's now Grid Lions, the innovation substation. And so that Gentai, it's a relatively short Gentai to plug into that uh, substation there. And so the project, and just to, just to clarify a few things I heard last night, the project's actually west of the existing DOT gravel pit that's out there. And it's five miles west of the town, about two miles west of Cactus City to the buildable areas of the project. And, it's one of those sites, it's a good site, and there's few of those sites now when it comes to siting renewable energy that are close to infrastructure, close to transmission that we can get projects on the ground. Back to you, Greg. Thank you very much, Levi, I appreciate that. Uh, I'll present you with a project overview, our guests with a project overview. Uh, background, it was in site, it's been sited entirely on BLM solar variance lands designated by the 2012 solar PIS they had mentioned earlier. The application area is not within a right-of-way exclusion area under the 98 Las Vegas Resource Management Plan. And the BLM received an application, the SF-299 in 2020. Efforts to date is the fully executed interconnection agreement to deliver power via the California Independent Service Operator, which manages the flow of electricity on high voltage power lines throughout Nevada and California with a 2025 delivery date. Uh, initiate uh, permit uh, permitted with BLM uh, with a uh, commitment to schedule. And this project has been designated as a uh, fast 41 project, which is a congressional act. Uh, over to the right, you can see uh, Creech Air Force Base, Indian Springs, and the orange icon there is the uh, the boundary 
uh, of the project as submitted in their SF-299. If we could go to the next slide, please. Some project details for you. Uh, it's approximate, it, it's, it, they're asking for approximately 2,500 acres to be developed in within the 5,131 acres application. Uh, the reason for the larger amount is so they can move the, the project around inside the, the 5,000 acres, but this should be about a 2,500 uh, acres of disturbance uh, if approved. Uh, it, it would then connect to the Valley Electric Association's existing 230 innovation substation, as mentioned before, that's uh, Grid Alliance. Uh, the project is looking to produce 300 megawatts of solar with battery energy storage system, and that's equivalent to 80,000 homes of energy use per year. Uh, there's a really nice access for this project along US Route 95. And the gen tie or generation tie-in, it's the it's the transmission line that goes from the project to the substation is about 5.4 uh, miles long. It's a single or double circuit that hasn't been decided yet. It would be a 230 transmission line from the on-site project substation, which is the where the project collects the energy, puts it on the transmission line, and then sends that uh, across the transmission line to the innovation substation, which happens to be in Nye County. It's located within existing transmission corridors and adjacent to existing transmission lines currently. So uh, the transmission line would be right next to existing transmission and not spread out all over the place. Uh, so that map is a good map that kind of zooms into the, the, uh, the project area there and shows you where innovation is and where that generation tie-in uh, line is. If you go to the next slide, please. Uh, desert, a little bit of a desert tortoise background for you. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife designated critical habitat, we're showing that in green on this map. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Priority 1 connectivity area is shown in blue. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Priority Connectivity 2, Priority 2 connectivity area is shown in yellow. And Bonanza is being represented on this map by a, a star, a black star west of Indian Springs for reference. If we could go to the next slide, please. Desert tortoise connectivity, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife identified certain BLM variance lands as priority one or priority two connectivity areas as described in the solar PEIS, which I mentioned before. Prior, priority one con connectivity areas are where the least cost corridor modeling identified potential habitat linkages between existing conservation areas that have the best chance of sustaining connectivity for the desert tortoise. Priority one designations do not prohibit the BLM from using, from issuing uh, land use authorizations such as right-of-ways. Appendix D currently available out, uh, out there on e-planning, and we'll show you later in in our segment where that is. Uh, Appendix D of the the preliminary plan of development describes our current knowledge of desert tortoise occurrence within the application area, and the BLM is currently coordinating. Uh, the connectivity modeling with the University of Nevada, Reno uh, professor to better understand the functioning habitat linkages in the area. We're also working with the Desert Tortoise Recovery Area and Mr. Mark Slaughter, who is also on this call, is an integral part of, of uh, that team to, uh, to work on this connectivity modeling and, and get a good understanding of that. If we could go to the next slide, please. Next steps, uh, we're in the variance process, we're the current phase that we're in. If BLM approves, if, then we would initiate the NEPA process to conduct an environmental, uh, the, the process doesn't mean necessarily that we release a notice of intent to do an EIS, but we would look to conduct environmental surveys and impact analysis. Uh, currently, we've had some uh, some of that work already been done with biological resources, cultural resources, jurisdictional delineation, visual resource assessment and simulations. And of course, public involvement is always key to any NEPA process. So all that would be initiated if this project uh, is approved in the variance process, which we showed how that process works in the previous slides. Uh, next slide, please. Anticipated permits. These are anticipated permits. They may not be all of them and uh, authorizations that are needed if project is approved from the variance. So federally, they would need a National Environmental Policy Act, that's NEPA. Uh, it, 
they may need a 404 Clean Water Act permit if the regulated waters are present. Uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service biological opinion and incidental take authorizations under the Endangered Species Act for tortoise. National Historic Preservation Act under 106 would also be required. From the state, uh, Nevada Utility Environmental Protection Act permit uh, to construct uh, that come, would come from the PUC. An encroachment permit for uh, project access uh, road to the US 95 from the Nevada Department of Transportation would also be needed. Uh, locally, we're looking at Clark County special use permit, a Nye County special use permit, building permits and grading permits. These may not be all of the permits that are needed, but these are the uh, highlighted permits that uh, we chose to uh, let folks know about that would be needed. If we go to the next slide, please. Preliminary construction schedule, uh, preliminary, uh, is to start in April of 24 with a duration of 20 months and a commercial operation date of December 2025. Those are the drop dead goals, milestones, if you will, that, uh, that uh, the, the dates that are trying to be met. Questions and answer session. You can type a question, you can type it, you can type in a question in the Q&A feature. If you if you're calling in, I don't see anyone calling in, but if you please if you are calling in, uh, please press star 9 to raise your hand. The host will unmute you when it's your turn to ask a question. When there are no new unique questions, uh, we will transition into the public input session. The public input sessions for you to make a public comment and have that public comment captured. However, we will not be uh, treating that as a question uh, that will receive a, uh, a, a, an answer. So Q&A is the, the opportunity for questions and answers. So Darren Debota is first on our list this evening. He got in uh, first here. Uh, Brian, are, okay. So traditional uh, ecological knowledge regarding the song, uh, regarding the Salt Song Trail uh, passing through the solar project. When developing cultural resource part of the NEPA process, if you include traditional ecological knowledge, other cultural concerns, Moapa Band of Paiutes is uh, going north on I-95 on southern side of Mount Sterling passing uh, Indian Springs it is a silhouette of Native American face. Uh, so yes, Darren, we, we have a very robust uh, uh, archaeological program and uh, uh, Tim Vandervoort would be working with you and uh, I know that we have already done a little bit of work with you so we look to uh, continue that relationship and uh, your great relationship with Southern Nevada so uh, we'll make sure that we um, we do uh, the appropriate things to uh, to knowledge uh, with knowledge regarding to the Salt Song Trail and uh, any other traditional uh, uh, knowledge that uh, would be helpful to pass on so that we can uh, identify that. Uh, so really appreciate your comments. Thank you, Darren. Uh, will GreenLink transmission be impacted by new transmission line for Bonanza Solar? That is, that's a no. There's existing transmission currently at 90 feet for Creech Air Force Base. It's a Nevada Energy line. And then there's the uh, the Grid Alliance line. Uh, this, this will, they're, their gen tie will be in a corridor with the other transmission lines. This 230 is typically about a hundred, it'll be probably about 90 feet in the air again uh, because of uh, Creech Air Force Space. But there's plenty of room in the corridor and it will not affect GreenLink. And GreenLink goes right past this substation. So this is not a GreenLink uh, connection that, that's being looked for. So thank you for that question, Darren. Uh, Carl, uh, good evening, Carl. Is the developer placing adequate funds in an escrow account for the decommissioning of the site after its 30 year life cycle? The answer to that, Carl, is yes. We, we carry bonds on all of the, we bond all of the solar installations. And uh, typically what we do after the, uh, uh, we do it before we issue a notice to proceed and then after a notice to proceed and it's built, uh, we like to get what's called the as-built drawing so that we can look at what's been built and run that through engineers to see if the bond is adequate enough for the site. And then 
On top of that, every five years, we look at the bond for inflation values, just make sure that we have an adequate amount in there should the uh, solar site need to be decommissioned after a, a 30 year life cycle. Life cycle. Uh, the grants are available to, uh, they can ask to, to uh, go longer on their grant too. It has a section in the grant for uh, uh, being reauthorized. Uh, so it's not just one authorization and it's done. It, it has the opportunity to carry on after 30 years, uh, just to make sure that's clear. Uh, Darren DeBota, thank you for the question. Hello, Darren. Uh, will Bonanza's solar project uh, look at 100 and 500 year flood events because I-95 had a flood flush, flash flood events in the past? Yes, Darren, that's uh, part of the NEPA process. And uh, hydrology is a very big concern in those areas where you get mountain runoff uh, and alluvial fans that, that get over to uh, the roads and, and have washouts uh, and then stormwater prevention pollution plan and a bunch of other concerns with hydrology will be addressed uh, if we make it into the NEPA phase. Uh, great question. Uh, Shannon, uh, good evening. How much carbon do you estimate this area is storing in its soils and plant life? I'm not able to answer that question, Shannon. We haven't done any studies on that. That would be response. That would be a response in the NEPA document, uh, where we would do those studies uh, for greenhouse gases and such. So uh, that's where we'll find that data at this time. And this is the variance process, and we're we're not we're not that uh, that far into uh, the process. If it goes gets through the uh, variance process, we will we will look at that. Uh, Shannon, again, uh, can you explain what extent you have been in contact with the tribes? Uh, we have tribal letters that have gone out uh, inviting them to participate in the process. We have uh, communications. Southern Nevada has a, a great robust program where they communicate with the tribes regularly. Uh, so just starting the project, we are just starting to um, get out there and, and, and talk with the tribes. Tim Vanderbilt is a very excellent archeologist who is uh, consistently uh, working on communication with the tribes. So uh, should this project uh, move forward, there will be a, a, a whole lot more um, uh, communication and meetings with the tribes. Uh, Shannon, uh, how many uh, creosote do you estimate are on the site and how old would you estimate their root systems? Uh, that's a question for NEPA, Shannon. I, I, we don't have those studies uh, yet that I'm aware of. This is, uh, that's, that's further into the NEPA process, which this is not. Uh, but I can tell you that that's an important uh, uh, issue to make sure that we, uh, we capture in, uh, in our NEPA document. Um, thank you. Can you tell us the name of the developer again? Sure, the name of the developer is EDF. They're currently on, they're Devin Muto and Levi Cox. Uh, they have, their emails are available uh, should you uh, feel the need to reach out or you can communicate with us and uh, reach out to us and we'll put you in contact with them if you'd like to be in contact with the, uh, with the applicant. But the uh, developer is EDF, thank you. Uh, Shannon, when the panels are decommissioned, would they go to a landfill that accepts toxic waste as most are currently? A lot of panels, it depends on the panel, Shannon. A lot of panels have recycle centers or they come with stickers on the back of them for recycle. I know this to be true with First Solar. Uh, there's an actual phone number on the back of the panel that, you, that can be called and, and the panel can be turned in for recycling and how their recycling process works. I am not aware, but I know that they do have a pretty extensive recycling program. I know some other solar providers also have a recycling program, but I'm not as up to speed on what they do with their recycling. Uh, it is true the bond that we uh, capture, uh, if we need to reclimate the site, uh, the panels would be taken to a, uh, to a landfill that would accept uh, the panels. Uh, so it's all information that would be disclosed in a, in a, in a NEPA document uh, as far as any of that process would go. But that is a fantastic question. Thank you. Uh, Shannon, you got all the good questions. How many gallons of water would be uh, sprayed uh, per day during construction in an attempt to mitigate dust? 
great question, Shannon. We 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 don't have we're not there yet. Uh, we realize that this is a potentially dusty area. Uh, we do have palliatives available for use with tortoise uh, that that uh, we've had for a couple of years. So there could be a combination of palliatives and and uh, and water use uh, to knock down the dust. And there could also be mitigation measures uh, like uh, sensors, PM10 stations that are monitoring the dust to mitigate. Uh, it to make sure that we're within range of proper mitigation. Again, that's very much a NEPA uh, topic and uh, a very much a planned uh, issue that we're aware of should this progress to NEPA. But thank you. Uh, where where would the develop Shannon again? Where would the developer source the water to be sprayed during construction? Uh, that's not known. There is a section in the uh, at the uh, e-planning that talks about a little bit about water and some plans for water and the amount of water needed. Uh, this this exact question came up last night. Uh, we brought the uh, EDF online and they basically identified that they have not uh, figured that out at this time. They're working on that uh, issue. So uh, when that's resolved, that would be a, a, a something that we would put out there so that folks could see either on the e-planning website or or uh, make sure that we, we notify individuals that uh, that has been uh, identified. At this time, it's it's not an identification. So thank you very much, Shannon. Hello, Darren. Uh, the water the water resource for the project uh, being impacting Amargosa, De Amargosa Desert Hydrological Basin will Will there be water monitoring wells at the site? That's exactly what what Shannon's little bit of Shannon's question was, and where I was going. That if the hydrology and the water source that is chosen uh, requires monitoring wells to make sure that uh, affected resources in the area, uh, that could very well be a mitigation measure. That's a very good question, Darren. Uh, so yes, we were aware of the hydrolog hydrological uh, issues in the area. Great question, uh, Amy. I hope your uh, hope your your issues got worked out and you can hear us just fine. Uh, we are against solar farms in Pahrump. We recently had a meeting with our planning and zoning department, and the permit was not recommended to the board of county commissioners. We don't want our water used for dust control either. What are you doing to access water for these projects, and how uh, will the power Grizz, probably grid in Nye County be affected when this starts up. Uh, unknown on how the power, we don't manage the power uh, grid, it's with the balancing authority, so that's not a BLM function. Uh, the balancing authority is always making sure that the power is balanced just right so that lights aren't going out. Uh, the water for the project, uh, the last three comments have been about water and we don't know what where the water would be uh, coming from or what mitigation measures would be needed for the water. And uh, uh, that's about it on the, the, the availability that I can answer at this time on that, on that question. Thank you very much, Amy. Um, hello, Shannon. Uh, have the tribes responded to any letters that you have sent out? If so, who has responded? Uh, Tim? Uh, could you come in on this question for me, please? You're the archaeologist on this. I know the letters have gone out. Have we received any responses? Hey there. Um, yeah, so we have heard back from Moapa Band of Paiute, um, who are on the call as well. Um, we just completed answering, I think, every single question on their list. Um, and we're going to be sending that out soon. It's also going to be included in our response or um, that next update um, to public comment on the plan of development. Um, and then we're also gonna be beginning um, contacting uh, other tribes. We're consulting with 15 in total. Um, that's how many were sent out, uh, how many letters were sent out, or at least uh, different tribes, I mean. Um, and we are also working with the field office to identify a good date to um, start cultural resources field work um, and that will also be uh, done in uh, in cooperation with tribes willing to participate uh, wishing to participate in that aspect of the studies 
Um, those are, uh, but those are in advance of NEPA, not for the variants. Um, uh, EDF has indicated that they're willing to pay for those studies regardless of whether or not variance is approved. But we will be working as closely with tribes as um, they have capacity to uh, work with us. And um, we're gonna hopefully be doing all that uh, in the timeline of the project. Thank you very much, Tim, for coming on to answer that question. And then Shannon, will uh, if you have further tribal uh, questions offline, please contact me. I could put you in touch with Tim and he could follow up with you on any uh, further questions you might have. Uh, Carl, with the uh, dismiss, dismissal recycle, recycling percentages of our current uh, waste stream, that leads you to believe that the solar panels will do any better with with the dis with oh the with the dismal recycling percentages of our current waste stream, what leads you to believe that solar panels will do any better? I don't have the data, Carl. That will come out in the NEPA. With the date, we can absolutely add that data into the NEPA into the NEPA process of the uh, of the uh, percentage of recycling and and how that all works and put some kind of a, a robust chapter in there. For uh, to, to, to really address that issue. Um, so uh, thank you, Carl. Uh, Shannon, uh, she asks, are you going to post the recording online for folks who couldn't make it online? Yes, Shannon, uh, that is already being done by Kirsten Cannon, the fabulous public affairs officer on YouTube for last night's session. And then she will uh, be doing that again for tonight's session on YouTube. Uh, if you can't find it or having issues lo locating it, please contact us and we'll direct you and point you in the right direction. Be happy to do that. Uh, Amy, hi. Have you reached out to residents of the areas uh, you are talking about? Yes, we. we that, this question came up last night. Uh, the uh, the applicant EDF has been at Indian Springs a couple times for public meetings. We've also uh, are going to reach out to other uh, folks in the area and uh, and uh, uh, Levi, could you come on and uh, address that uh, about who you're reaching out to or Devin? Go ahead, Levi, you can start. Yeah, so we've actively reached out to the folks in Indian Springs. Um, we're working to, to reach out to folks in the other uh, surrounding uh, communities as well. I think one was mentioned last night. Um, so we're working through that process. We've actually got a feelers out there and are happy to meet with folks that, that want to meet with us. Thank you very much, gentlemen. And Amy, if you'd like to, uh, if you know of a specific community that would like to have uh, communication from the applicant, please reach out to us. We can get you in touch with Devin and Levi and, and make sure that uh, that they're being responsive to your needs. Appreciate that. Uh, John, hi, John. Uh, are there any other solar projects under discussion for this area? And if so, will the EIS look at a potential cumulative impacts? Of course it will, uh, John. And there are other solar projects in the area applied. Uh, there's uh, something across the street and one above. Uh, currently, the project's being looked at if we get, can get through variance as a plan amendment level document. Uh, that we're working with the authorized officer, Shauna Duman, who is on the call. And uh, we'll be looking at potentially uh, uh, saying that the area is uh, too greatly impacted for any more projects and, uh, and shut down the area for future development of solar projects. That could very well happen uh, based on what we're seeing from uh, Priority One Habitat with Tortoise. Uh, so there are uh, many uh, possibilities to the to a project moving forward in in, in enhancing uh, probability for the area and the tortoise. So, a great question, uh, John, and thank you for joining us tonight. Good to see you again, uh, Kevin. Uh, does the variance process require a visual uh, presentation of what the installation would look like as part of the visual impact assessment? It does not, Kevin. It's uh, it's addressed in the in the document, uh, but it's uh, a visual representation as part of a NEPA process with its alternatives. So uh, it's just it, this isn't a 
it's a process to go through and 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 get a concurrence from the director to whether or not the project should or can move forward uh, but there are some uh, visual uh, key observation points as we call them uh, looking to be established and some very uh, detailed uh, information on uh, making sure that we get good visual simulations uh, but that is a very important part of the uh, uh, of an environmental impact statement thank you very much uh, Kevin hi uh, we have been told that there will be a Nevada wide resource plan revision next summer should this make should this make it through variance would NEPA for Bonanza likely start before next yes Kevin uh, have you established a timeline so the if the statewide resource management plan uh, happens that's a separate process than what we're doing on um, on solar projects or wind projects or the green link projects uh, so it, 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 it'll be in concert. There's a lot of things that could be going on in parallel with uh, David Pritchard's team uh, for a Nevada wide resource uh, plan that, that you've heard of. Uh, so yes, uh, likely Bonanza would be uh, starting NEPA before uh, any such uh, Nevada resource plan got off the ground. Uh, thank you, Kevin, for that. Uh, hello, Shannon. Uh, would it be as dusty as yellow pine solar on the other side of Mount Charles? I don't know. Soil conditions, right? It's uh, yellow pine has a, a a soil type over here in the, this area. There's a different solar type. I I, I don't know uh, what that soil type presents and uh, the amount of dust. Uh, but it would be a very important topic in a, an environmental impact statement and, and to address. So thank you for the question, Shannon. Hello again, Amy. Uh, Jonathan, I closed the extra window. Thank you. Oh, that was the two things on uh, that we had on attendees. Thank you, Amy. I'm glad that it's working for you. Uh, Heather, uh, well, EDF sell carbon offset associated with this project thereby enabling big polluters to keep polluting and negating any carbon savings uh not aware of any thing that's come up on that it, it that's a a carbon offset association is a is a new thing that is happening in the uh at higher levels there's no uh, offset program that i'm aware of that has started yet so uh, that would be up to the applicant if there is a an, an offset uh, that's needed or uh, that they can apply for. Uh, but at this time, we don't have an answer to that, Heather. Uh, that's all very preliminary. Thank you for the question. That's a good question, though. Uh, Amy, hi. 2,200 acres in Boulder City use 20 million in, uh, I'm guessing this is water. So 20. 2,000 acres in Boulder City used 20 million gallons of water or acre feet of water in two months. Uh, Boulder City has a much different uh, requirement than uh, for their dust evasion. Uh, that's up to Boulder City. Uh, we'll make sure to analyze uh, the needs in the NEPA document should this move forward. Uh, Shannon, hi. Uh, are you going to post the recording of this meeting online for folks who could not attend? We've answered that. That must have been a repeat that we got from you, Shannon. So yes, YouTube, uh, again, uh, would be, and Kirsten Cannon, the fabulous public affairs officer, is currently doing that. Uh, Amy, one of our utilities is using our water in Pahrump. One of our utilities is using our water and pump. I don't know what utility that may be. You have Valley Electric there and Grid Alliance. Uh, so uh, water is a, is a product of the state water engineer. So I'm not sure what that would be uh, would be or or how that uh, how that is working out. Uh, there are no wells on the sites near Pump. I'm not aware of that information either. It's a state water engineer issue uh, when we do water on this project if it moves into NEPA it will clearly identify any uh, locations or sources of water. Uh, Darren hello again 
what will the meter uh, meteorological station air quality monitor? Uh, what will the monitor air quality monitor will meet state will met stations be monitoring air quality for a year uh, to met EPA air quality standards? Yes, there would be if if this is a, a an issue that comes up with that we need to uh, put some PM10 stations out there. Uh, we have an air quality. Uh, person that works at the state office also works for California, but we'll definitely pass all air quality uh, issues through that specialist uh, who who works for the BLM. So uh, excellent individual. Um, thank you, Darren. Kevin Emmerich. There have already been some surveys on the project site. Have they looked at paleo resources? Uh, I don't believe paleo has been looked at yet, uh, Kevin. Uh, it, it's one of the topics that currently uh, that typically comes up with uh, cultural. Uh, currently, we're at the variance stage. That doesn't require uh, a lot of the cultural uh, information, than, uh, cultural and paleo. So when that happens, uh, we'll definitely get to that if it happens. Uh, Amy, Clark County is putting in uh, once next to the Nye County border and we'll be using our water. We won't benefit from the solar energy. Where will the energy be used? Uh, well, the energy shows a connection at the innovation substation, which goes into the the Kaiso network. The energy would likely stay in Nevada. And if Kaiso chooses, California chooses to draw from that energy pool, it could, but most of the Kaiso energy stays in Nevada uh, unless drawn upon uh, for need uh, by Kaiso. It's not up to us uh, where uh, power on interconnects go. Uh, it's a it's a uh, interesting dynamic how they balance how the balancing authorities uh, to 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 balance the power so that people's lights turn on and air conditioners work and. And uh, especially during these hot times, it's it's uh, yeah, the grid is, is is quite taxed. Thank you for your question, uh, Darren Deboda. Uh, will microwave communication tower be located on site, and how tall will the tower be? Uh, it likely that there won't be a microwave uh, tower. Uh, I believe there's fiber optic if it's needed, and most. Most, if there is, we, we're not aware of that. It could possibly be in the plan of development. I haven't seen that. It's not part of the variance process. It would be part of the NEPA process. And um, the tower heights are dependent. Microwave tower heights are dependent on how, where the next repeater is and, and they need line of sight to bounce off of other uh, sites. I think spotted range is the next uh, closest site that it would aim for so whatever height that would need to be to, to clear to get a clear shot to there uh, microwave communication towers are used as redundant systems uh, fiber optic uh, communication is is typical uh, for power plants great question uh amy my son lives in the indian springs and i don't know my son lives in indian springs and didn't know about it um that's unfortunate we'll have likely some more uh, projects in Indian Springs. I, I found uh, the project, the uh, going to, to Indian Springs was uh, EDF went out there and tried to uh, let as many folks as possible know that they were there for the uh, community meeting and had, had fairly good attendance. So uh, we'll look to reach out to uh, other individuals in the area. Uh, thank you, Amy, for uh, identifying that, uh, that your son uh, wasn't aware of this potential project. Uh, Amy, please email me. Uh, have we? I hope we captured your email address. Oh, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead of Shannon. I apologize, Shannon. I uh, the list is moving up. Shannon, uh, would this pose a dust hazard for Indian Springs, like Yellow Pine is doing for Prump? Uh, it's part of the NEPA process to determine the the dust and how much dust, and we do have compliance inspection contractors who monitor projects uh, when they're under construction. And if dust is an issue, uh, then a compliance inspection contractor would be monitoring uh, the dust on windy days and uh, notifying the district office that there's a potential problem there. And then 
and then uh, there would be action taken to uh, mitigate. So great question uh, about dust and dust control. Uh, please email me. Hopefully, Amy, we have your email address uh, that you've given to Jonathan or one of us. Uh, we'll present some information in, in a little bit that shows you how to communicate with us through email. And we'll be happy to, uh, if you could just email us, we'll be happy to pass on your information. Uh, hi, Shannon. Are you aware of naturally occurring asbestos, yes, or other elements in the soil that could be harmful to human health through dust inhalation? Yes, we're aware of the natural occurring asbestos. I don't know if we have it in the area, but that is part of the study by specialists that, uh, that do soil uh, work, and they're the subject matter experts on that and whether or not it exists out there. Um, and uh, it is naturally occurring. So uh, that would be something to identify and it could be identified in the NEPA process. So it's a great question. Uh, it's not identified in the uh, variance process. It, that's, uh, that's a very specific study. Uh, great questions, Shannon, Good, great questions. Amy, uh, it was 20, oh, that's a repeat. That's a, they used 20,000 gallons in two months. That's a repeat on the 22,000 acres of Boulder City. I think we got a, a echo happening on some of the Q and A. No, she was just clarifying the earlier comment she made that it was 22 million gallons. Oh, gallons, yeah. because it didn't have yeah. the gallons. Yeah, yeah. she Thank was just you, clarifying Brian. that, yep. <laughs> Thank you, Amy, thank you. Sorry, I apologize for that. Uh, gallons, thank you. Uh, water is, again, something to be identified in the NEPA process and clearly identified, clearly articulated and clearly uh, uh, talked about. Uh, at this time, we don't have that information. Uh, Amy, our water utility is selling our groundwater in Nye County well owners are, uh, well, while maybe owners are allocated water, that could be happening with Nye County. I don't know what Nye County is doing with their water with their water utility. That's a Nye County decision that hasn't. Uh, we don't have control over that. It's a state product of the state water engineer. Uh, so thank you for that information. Uh, thank you for the info on water. Our commissioners have the right to say no to selling our water, according to Assemblyman in District 36, but I will bring this up at the meeting on September 20th. Thank you. Uh, that is, it's state, it's run by the state water engineer. So uh, thank you very much for that question and, uh, and response. Uh, Shannon, uh, if the uh, inspector identified a dust uh, compliance inspector and uh, identified a dust hazard and air quality violation during construction, what mitigation would be to stop it. Well, there's many tools in the toolbox. One of them is to put a stay on the project until the issue is resolved. That means no further work can be done until the issue is resolved. Uh, so the compliance inspection contractor is in very close coordination with the Southern Nevada District Office, should this go to construction. And um, if, if something happens like this or a spill or any kind of issue that that is, that the compliance inspection team is aware of, then they uh, communicate with the district office and uh, resolution is, is some form of resolution then uh, happens. And what type of resolution is dependent on what the impact is and how, uh, how the impact is affecting uh, the resource. So uh, that's the about the best I can do on the answer to that. That would all be put into the NEPA document on, on uh, that information. Uh, you said somebody will reach out to me. I asked them to have, I asked that, I asked to have them email me.nrgrus at yahoo. Can somebody, uh, Brian or, or uh, Jonathan capture the uh, email address so that we can reach out? Uh, out to yep, it's, it's, this will be part of the record. Yeah, I think Amy's email address is actually n n r g r u s, not m dot n r, but the actual n r n r g r u s at Yahoo. So we'll we'll communicate with you, Amy. Thank you, uh, Darren Deboda. Hi. Will Bonanza Solar Project leave vegetation intact like Gemini Solar Project, providing low dust abatement issues at the, uh, providing low dust abatement issues at the Gemini? 
uh, yeah, that's the typical way to do uh, construction nowadays, uh, Darren. And uh, I can tell you Southern Nevada has a very robust uh, process in place for uh, vegetation and impacts uh, that help mitigate dust control. So um, they're, they're, uh, they're leading the way on that. I think I've made it through uh, 44 questions that have been answered. We'll give it a minute or two to see if somebody has another question that they've thought of that they'd like answered. The question and answer session will be open still. Yeah, so we'll give it a couple of minutes to make sure we've got plenty of time here, folks. It's only 6.52, we've got another hour uh, to go. Uh, so uh, we'll be happy to give it a little bit of time to see if you've got another question. Uh, for us. Give it at least a, a couple of minutes anyways. Again, like to thank everybody for participating on a Thursday evening of September the 8th, 2022. I don't know, I don't see any of the questions and that's the fastest two minutes in history. So I'm almost thinking we should go to the next slide. Brian, are you ready with the timer? Oh, we got a question. Uh, FYI correction, well owners in Nye County are allocated two acre feet of water. The state engineer has no jurisdiction unless there are certain criteria is met. Water brokers and water utilities have paper water rights. That is an issue. That, that's the issue with Nye County well owners. Thank you for the clarification, Amy. I'm, we haven't dove into that far yet into that. Uh, we're just at the variant stage. So that uh, great information for us to, uh, to, to go off of. Uh, very well informed. Uh, uh, so thank you for contributing that uh, information to us. Darren, around site location, what happens of uh, predator birds or around site location, what types of predator predatory birds are located in the area. We've had some studies on raptors done in the area, Darren, with the green link going through there, we're aware of the raptors and predator, uh, predatories. So uh, often with any type of raptors, uh, raptor mitigation measures, and Nevada has a very uh, robust raven management plan uh, that could also be used to, uh, to uh, negate or mitigate for uh, raptors in the area, uh, as you're aware of. So uh, yeah, that's a great question. Always of concern. See, I went through the quickest two minutes in history and all of a sudden two more questions came in. So I will give it a little bit longer this time. Uh, Brian, did you respond? Are you ready with that timer? Have it handy when we're when we get to that point. Okay, I just wanted to check with you, sir, to make sure that you were ready, since you're controlling the action on that side. All right, let's move to the next slide, please, Brian. This is going to be the public input session. The input should be a set, a substantive in nature, not merely I support or oppose this application. Uh, substantive comments uh, should be focused on concerns within the responsibility of the BLM, not in issues that are that are not, such as requiring rooftop solar on new buildings or solar shade, shade canopies. We don't have any uh, authority over uh, distributive generation. Uh, Reverend, I'll get to your question here before we move on. Uh, hang on just a second. And then uh, most valuable uh, input would be how do you use the uh, how do you use the application area, i.e., citing a uh, rock counting OHV use, or another valuable input could be uh, what do you know about the cultural and natural resources in the application area? Those would be good good questions. Uh, so another question and answer from the question and answer input session: uh, Copperman hawks, red tail hawks, herons. Oh, these are listing all the uh, birds, all uh, migrate through Cactus Springs and many, many others. Uh, yeah, and we work very, very close with the uh, migratory bird section of fish and wildlife on many of those subjects. 
And uh, like I mentioned before, uh, Mark Slaughter is an excellent biologist down there in Southern Nevada, a supervisory biologist. And he's been there for quite a while. So he's very, very aware of, of uh, the avian species. Uh, he's a tortoise expert, but he's uh, also great with avian. Uh, so uh, we got, we're in good hands on that. So thank you for, for, uh, for listing that for us. Uh, that's, that's very valuable. Uh, we're back to public input session continue. Each speaker will have up to two minutes, which is what I was talking to with Brian on the timer. Uh, you'll actually see that. If you're calling in, please press star nine to raise your hand. The host will unmute you when it's your turn to provide input. Uh, last night when, when folks were uh, ready to speak, it took a minute or two to get them off mute and, and them to come off mute. So be patient with us on that a little bit. Uh, uh, as soon as you feel that you're off mute, uh, please uh, ask us to make sure that uh, we can hear you. Uh, that would be great. And then we'll give you a verbal response. Uh, we're, we're scheduled until eight. We'll be here till eight. We were here till eight last night. So we will absolutely be here. Glad to be here. Uh, and then please, again, folks, be respectful to all parties on the call. Uh, we're going to get into the public uh, input session. Uh, uh, this is their opportunity to give us uh, input. So be respectful of uh, any folks that are giving input. Uh, we're going back to the question and answer. Coyotes and wild horses are in some areas. How are they going to be uh, protected? Uh, there, I don't have an answer for that. That's a great uh, question for the NEPA document uh, about uh, horses and uh, coyotes and any protection measures needed for those uh, biological, um, in the biological section of the NEPA document. So uh, Amy, thank you very much. We haven't identified any of that in the variance process. It's, it's too far down the, uh, uh, too far down in the, in the uh, analysis. Uh, but thank you very much, Amy. That was uh, th that's great to to understand and know about. Uh, so we go to questions. I saw that Kevin had his hand up first. So Kevin, and if we, you you'll be coming off mute, uh, we could bring you off mute here, and you'll have two minutes for your uh, opportunity here, please. Well, thank you again. Um, I do have a comment. Um, I, the reason I brought up in the question the resource plan, I'm doing a plan amendment process starting next summer really isn't that long. Um, and it's worthwhile to request that you do so. Um, I think the desert tortoise is really a good example. Um, if you look at some of the Fish and Wildlife Service studies, they do say that many of the recovery areas of the tortoise have declined in a 10 year period by 40%, which is pretty significant. And because we have such a significant connectivity area that we're talking about here, um, there is a, a, a real need for um, maybe even a stronger conservation and simply a recognition of priority one connectivity habitat. Don't get me wrong, it's good to have that. That's a very um, significant um, um, piece of knowledge that's out there, but it seems as though um, the efforts to protect that just are not strong enough. Um, waiting for that resource plan to be revised would give an opportunity to ask for an ACEC primarily to protect desert tortoise connectivity. And as you remember, you did establish something of similar size and Ivan Paul Valley, and that was with the um, approval of the Silver State South Solar Project. And that was, that was all based on tortoise connectivity, and that was a significant area. So that would be my comment and um, request. Slow this down, um, wait for that resource plan to be revised, and give us a chance to talk about some smarter long-term land use planning. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Carl, uh, you're up next. We'll go ahead and unmute. Carl, please. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Thank you. Oh, okay. Um, this I'm going to just read off an article. of uh, It's on uh, Deseret.com uh, titled The Dark Side of 
green energy and its threat to the nation's environment. So although countries are feverishly looking to install wind and solar farms to wean themselves off of carbon-based or so-called dirty energy, few countries, operators, or industries itself have, tr have yet to fully tackle the long-term consequences of how to dispose of these systems, which have their own environmental hazards like toxic metals, oil, fiberglass, and other materials. A briefing paper released by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency predicts these startling global numbers for countries by 2050 just for solar waste. The U.S. 10 million tons, Germany 3 million tons, China 20 million tons, Japan 7.5 million tons, India 7.5 million tons. Solar arrays have a life cycle of about 30 years, but the rapid adoption solar in the U.S. and elsewhere has a problem of disposal creeping up in the rear view mirror faster rather than later. It's a green waste growth. In 2019, according to the Solar Energy Industry Association, the U.S. surpassed 2 million solar installations just three years after it hit the 1 million milestone. The paper points out that the solar growth waste is already straining recycling and disposal cap capabilities with some panels and properly ending up in municipal landfills or stacking up in warehouses while the wait continues for more inexpensive routes to recycle. Research, research underscores there are few incentives to recycle solar panels as the cost of recovering the materials outweighs the cost of extracting what can be recycled even without adding transportation costs. The issue foreshadows the potential for creating- minutes has expired. Okay. Yeah, your time has expired, Carl. Okay. Uh, if you'd like to uh, line up again in, in the queue, that's fine. Uh, we'll go to, we, we have uh, time this evening. So uh, if you could, uh, if you'd like to line back up in the queue, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, Hi, Amy, we're gonna to get to your question and answer. Uh, there are endangered pupfish in Amargosa uh, where there will be a list of species to examine for each area, yes. Uh, and we're, we're, we're very aware of the pupfish uh, up at Devil's Hole, uh, both the pupfish uh, in the area and, and the pupfish actually in Devil's Hole. So uh, yeah, those those species would be uh, examined in the biological section of the NEPA document should uh, we get through variants. Uh, but thank you very much, Amy. That's a great question. And uh, don't see any hands raised. Uh, we can give it a couple minutes to see if we've got anybody who wants to participate with a hand raising. And I see a 702 number, uh, just to reiterate, if you can hear me, uh, 702, uh, in order to participate and, and to put in a comment, you would be using star nine to raise your hand, and then we can unmute you if you choose to, uh, to supply us with a comment this evening. Uh, so thank you for, for participating. Uh, Shannon has a, uh, uh, a, a comment. Uh, if we could unmute Shannon, that would be great. Yeah, hi, thank you. Okay, can you you can hear me? Okay, thanks. Yes. Um, I just I wanted to make a comment about the new mowing procedure that's being touted as the typical way that solar facilities are now built and the typical way that the land is prepared, I suppose you might say. Um, I've been watching it out at the Yellow Pine Solar Site on the other side of Mount Charleston off to Copa Road in the South Trump Valley. And I just gotta say, it's just not much better than fully grading the soil. I mean, everything is completely gone. They cut down 92,000. They are in the process of cutting down 92,000 Mojave Yucca, um, just shredding them. And creosote, all gone. Um, they're supposed to mow down to two feet, but um, that's not happening. And most of the vegetation is gone, and the desert soil is completely destroyed, as if it were bulldozed. We have a lot of documentation of this. I've got a lot of video footage because I've been out there. Um, quite a lot really observing it um, at mojavegreen.org. We've got video footage and um, my colleague, Justin McAfee has made documentary series called Desert Apocalypse. You can see that at desertapocalypse.com. 
Um, he's got drone footage of the yellow pine site and it shows everything just completely gone. And um, my photos as well show everything completely gone and it really um, shows the dust hazard. So I've been out there multiple days and just had average wind, not even big winds and had a lot of dust coming off. And then in big winds, um, we've actually observed it coming all the way to Pahrump in, in big clouds and um, have seen that it is indeed coming off the Yellow Pine solar site. Um, so, so that's really problematic. The mowing is not a solution. Um, it doesn't preserve the, the vegetation. It doesn't preserve any of the um, soils. And um, it's really bad. And I think the BLM recognizes that it's bad. Um, and maybe your hands are just tied or something, but we, we got to do something. To, we, can't, we can't keep doing this. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, all right, 702, uh, we're going to unmute you. If you could identify yourself, uh, that would be great. Just for the uh, record, we are recording this conversation. And it appears they are muted themselves. So if you could please unmute yourself. Is there a button they need to push to unmute themselves on the uh, phone? Yeah, I've, I've unmuted it, them from uh, our side. So okay. like there's a mute issue on their side. Uh, Oh, looks like they, they came off. They, it looks like we've come off mute. Brian, your timer. 702, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes, there you are. Thank you. Oh, okay. Good grief. <laughs> uh, my name is Amy. I decided to call in because it's easier for me. And uh, I do uh, reiterate what Shannon was saying because I live in Pahrump. And uh, it's been a huge problem out here. And uh, I don't know if the BLM visits these areas where they put up these solar farms or not, but we have Hudud type sandstorms caused from the, the way they're, you know, scraping the soil barren. And uh, my, our biggest concerns out here, number one, is the water that's being used to keep that dust down. Because like I was saying online that the, 2,200 acres in Boulder City took 20 million gallons of water in two months. And this project's going to go much longer, and it's one and a half times bigger. So we're looking at an acre foot of water a, a day being used just to keep the dust down. And so I don't know how much of a benefit that's going to be for any environmental uh, condition. And in the long run, uh, when you talk about the lithium mining, that's gonna take a lot of water and batteries that are gonna to have to be replaced and what the heck is gonna happen with all that stuff. It's just an ongoing problem. Um, and we don't really uh, look forward to those kinds of changes out here in Nye County. We have individuals that put individual solar panels on their roof, but that's not the same thing. That's hardly uh, a problem if, if the government wants to uh, create a green energy, then do something, an incentive, in my opinion, for people to be able to afford so solar. Um, so it's a big issue, bigger than what, it, so, you know, people try to make it simple, but it's really not simple, especially when you're talking about the total ecosystem, that uh, ecosystem that's out here that's being destroyed and around the country that's going to be destroyed. So it's not just here. And if this is going to be energy that's going to be used for, for Clark County, for example, let them take their solar farm on the other side of the mountain and do it over there. They have a water problem, too, but they don't want to use their water. They want us to truck our water in there to deplete our two system, minutes, our Two basin. minutes have passed. Time is up. But anyway, I appreciate passed. with Shannon. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Brian. Uh... I don't see any questions in the Q&A, and I don't see any hands raised. So uh, uh, we do have uh, 45 minutes left, and 
uh, a little bit more than 45 minutes left. We'll, uh, where you, we are here, we're going to be here for the duration until eight o'clock. So if you uh, think of something that you'd like to either put in a public comment or uh, input or uh, put in the Q&A area, uh, please do so. Uh, it'll be quiet, uh, but uh, we, uh, we are here. Do you enjoy your work uh, from Shannon? Uh, yes, very much. Thank you. Uh, I guess that was a question for me. So, uh, <laughs> why? That's not a that's not a uh, available question on the bonanza uh, uh, variance topic. Uh, if you'd like to email me offline, Shannon, I'd, I'd be more than happy to uh, to have conversations with you on that. Uh, so, Brian, do we have a do we we have uh, further sections of the PowerPoint, I believe, right? And we could show them uh, e planning and and where. Uh, that's another question. Do you like to evaluate in the solar project? Uh, you could email me and I'd be happy to answer that uh, offline, uh, Shannon. Um, so what I can do is go ahead to the next two slides that uh, will revisit where you send comments. And if you have not already visited the website, you can uh, and want to familiarize yourself with the uh, documents that we have available and that are open for public comment until September 22nd. So you can see at the top there, there is the hyperlink to the project website, which you may or may not already have possession of. And maybe you've already taken advantage of taking a look at the website, or maybe you are interested in taking a look at it. We have over 700 pages of materials already published on the website. So maybe you have a particular area of interest rather than trying to, in the next two weeks, read through more than 700 pages of materials. So we have a piece on desert tortoise. We have a piece on our knowledge of the vegetation that exists in that area. There is a water supply and demand analysis um, report that's been put together. And there's been some preliminary visual resources um, simulation type material that's been put together at a very preliminary stage. In addition to the variance factors analysis report, again, more than 700 pages of material are currently available for you to read in the next uh, two weeks. And maybe again, you have a particular section that you're most interested in taking a look at and providing us substantive comments on. The next uh, thank, slide thank, yeah, thank then you, also shows you how to submit your comments. Thank you very much, Brian. Appreciate that. We have Kevin Emmerich who's raised his hand. Uh, could you bring the uh, timer back up, please? And if we could get uh, Kevin unmuted, that'd be great. Yeah, I, I think I'm unmuted. I let me get started here. Um, so, so anyway, um, yeah, I, I wanted to talk about the um, resource plan revision that I brought up. Um, However you do this, even if you do a plan amendment, you could have a good conservation alternative here. And why is that important with the desert tortoise? And, and I think it's really important because of the conditions of what's happening when you try to mitigate these with big solar projects. Now, it turns out like, um, as far as to the best of my knowledge, if they haven't been released yet, I don't think they have. Many of the tortoises moved from Gemini solar and even some from Yellow Pine solar ended up in that Clark County Desert Tortoise Conservation Center where they're keeping them captive and waiting for optimal conditions to release them. And, and that's more of a thing of, of the present than the past due to increasing drought, climate change. It, it appears that these increasing droughts and heat waves are affecting the very procedure that, that's standardly used to actually move desert tortoise. And um, as we know, we had that, uh, it was made a little bit famous last summer, um, yellow pine solar, when 33 of the desert tortoises were eaten by badgers, which generally do not go after tortoises. 
And so a lot of us feel that that was drought induced. And it's happened before in the past when they moved vortices on very dry years. Revising that plan, um, doing a plan amendment, making a conservation area would actually make sense. And in, in a region that the federal agencies, Interior Department identified as very important, the desert tortoise. So thanks again. Thank you, Kevin. Brian, if we could go to that last slide, please, that would be great. Um, that's the uh, uh, where any written comments can be provided to Bonanza Solar at BLM.gov uh, by September 22nd, like Brian had mentioned, or comments can also be submitted to uh, Brian at the BLM Nevada State Office at 1340 Financial Boulevard. We'll bring this up again uh, soon. And uh, Brian, I believe, is preparing to uh, show you the e planning site. So, uh, folks who aren't maybe not familiar with that location uh, that was presented in the previous slide. Uh, can see it and and be actually uh, a little bit familiar with what's there. So whenever you're ready, Brian, go ahead and uh, switch to that um, that for us. And and then uh, and then Brian will be given the presentation on on what's there and available and and uh, what you're seeing. It'll just take me a minute to navigate over there. I have too many things open on my computer right now. When we made the announcement for this public input session, we notified people by postcard and by email and by news release. And we used this hyperlink at the top here as the location for people to access project information. Um, we did not make up that hyperlink naming convention, unfortunately. So it appears to be a bit gobbledygook and number oriented. Um, nothing we can do about that. But once you're there and you're at the home page, you can read some basic information at the beginning on the home page. And then you can flip to the documents page where there are several sets of materials. And there is the uh, PowerPoint that we are going through tonight that has been published yesterday on this website. You can also find under the variance overview piece, the BLM news release the workflow slides that Greg went through earlier for the variance process. Here's that variance factors analysis report. This is what would ultimately go to the BLM director should the state director make that recommendation to continue to move this along the course. This is the document that would actually be presented to the BLM director. Um, so it is in draft state, and we will certainly be looking for additional comments and revisions on that to assist us in completing it. And then you can see that there's also about 10 other documents associated with the preliminary plan of development, including appendices on desert tortoise, vegetation, habitat conditions, soils, visual and water supply. And those documents will all remain on the website for through September 22nd and beyond. Um, they'll basically remain out there um, until we update them at some later date this fall or winter. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Brian, for present uh, presenting that information. I see that Shannon has her hand up. If we could go to the clock, uh, that would be great. And then we'll give uh, Shannon the opportunity to uh, make a public comment, please. Yeah, did I am I am I unmuted here? I can hear you. Thank okay, you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, you know, I just wanted to say too that I understand that the BLM, you know, only is in charge of public lands, and so you say you have nothing to do with other alternatives about renewable energy, um, such as urban solar installations on large tracts of uncovered parking lots, um, etc., such as the two and a half million. Um, between two and a half million to seven and a half million acres of exposed parking lots that we have in the United States. Um, I get that you have no jurisdiction over that, but um, 
if you took it, if you, and I get to that your job is to manage public lands, it's not to protect public lands, it's to manage them for various uses. I understand that. And at the same time, it seems like, um, you know, you guys could take more of a role and say, you know, these, these natural ecosystems are intact. These are some of the largest tracts of intact ecosystems that we have in the United States. Um, deserts are arid lands are known to be storing about one third of carbon on land and we'll be losing all of that storage capacity. So you guys could be like heroes, you know, you could come out with this and say the BLM, you know, while we manage public lands for various uses, we recommend that alternative sites in the urban environment be prioritized by the Biden administration, right, for um, renewable energy development and that the Biden administration incentivize companies like EDF and NextEra Energy and all the others to in fact work with private landowners and you encourage you and the Department of Interior encourage this and I mean it would be so good you know instead of like fighting this the whole way and knowing that this is bad knowing that this is wrong um, you know you guys could be heroes and everybody would say that's amazing like wow America's America's uh, Bureau of Land Management is leading the way for the whole world um, in a way forward that's truly sustainable and doesn't cause harm. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, Brian, could you flip up to the previous slide? Kevin's comment is uh, the URL of the website uh, so that he could see that. If you'd like to hit your uh, print screen uh, function, uh, Kevin, you could capture that on your computer. Uh, or uh, there's the availability of going to the uh, the website uh, uh, to to capture this also on the Nevada website. Uh, there's directions on on that that take you to this, but there's the e-planning uh, website for you, Kevin. Thank you for your question, uh, Shannon. Uh, what projects on variance? Let's see. Wait for this to flip up. There we go. What projects on variance land has the state director decided that BLM uh, should not proceed. Uh, there have been uh, about three projects on variance in Nevada that have gone through for approval. Uh, well, there's the Esmeralda 7. That was really one variance, seven projects. And then there's been three others that have been uh, approved. Probably, I think, one in Southern Nevada, maybe two. I think the number's close to about nine uh, that have been approved to move forward through variants. Uh, if you'd like to email me, I could give you the exact uh, reference and, and the projects that have been approved. Thank you for the question, Shannon. Hopefully folks are being able to capture that, uh, that uh, uh, input. Um, then Jonathan Riggs looks like he's also placing it in the chat uh, for uh, that. How many have been denied is, was that the question that we answered? Uh, none have been denied that I'm aware of. Uh, they've made it through the variance process. Uh, that doesn't mean that they've made it through the NEPA process, but I'm not aware of any variants that have been denied uh, at this time. Brian, if you could go back to the other slide uh, for comments on where those comments are to be posted. Uh, Shannon has another question here. How many have been denied in the NEEP process? I don't know if that's BLM wide or just in the Nevada. Uh, I'm not aware of that. Shannon, if you could uh, give me an email on that question, I could uh, have Brian look that up or, uh, okay, you're referring to Nevada. So you wanna know how many projects have been denied uh, for renewable energy in Nevada? Uh, that would be a question that uh, if you could send us an email on, we could give you a response to. I don't have that number in front of me that requires a look at the uh, uh, e-planning site and uh, some other information that I would need to do research on for any potential closed applications. Um, 
and you're specifically asking about the NEPA process. So from a record to decision uh, denial is uh, if you're being specific to that. Uh, Kevin is one was denied through the variance in uh, the Valley in California, but not aware of others. So Kevin is trying to respond uh, to you, Shannon, and Shannon is yes. Uh, so. So just to clarify, this is Brian. Um, the NEPA process does not reject or deny projects per se. Now we are required by 50 years of case law and the regulations to analyze a no action alternative. And under the no action alternative, the BLM would not approve a right of way application. So that alternative is available to us. Um, but more often we have projects where we have pending applications and for whatever circumstances, the applicant often withdraws their, their applications for us and they never enter into the NEPA process. Um, so I don't believe we can find that information about where we have ever issued a decision to authorize to approve the no action alternative, which would be rejecting the applicant's alternative. I don't believe that information exists because generally companies are not going to spend the money they do on the NEPA process to only have their application result in the selection of a no action alternative. So I just don't think we can find that information, Greg. Yeah, I, I, I... I don't know of a project that has gotten to a record of decision and then offered a right-of-way grant that where the record of decision has denied it. I am aware of plenty of records of decisions where the BLM alternative is selected and not the applicant's alternative. So there's a process through the NEPA process that adjusts and changes and mitigates uh, the project and the BLM preferred uh, or a mix of alternatives is selected. Uh, maybe that's the question that Shannon's after specifically, but I'm not either aware of. Uh, but if you'd like to send us an email, Shannon, we'll we'll do the research to uh, to look at it and, and provide an answer. Uh, Kevin Emmerich's question is, FYI, I've never seen BLM select a no action alternative. That's uh, Kevin's response. He, he too has not seen that. So uh, we can look uh, for Nevada and um, and then give you a response. Thank you for that question, Shannon, and thank you for your response, Kevin. We've got about a half hour to go, folks. Uh, more than happy to take any more questions that you have uh, or any uh, opportunity that you'd like to uh, uh, present with some input. That would be great. We have the little timer sitting up there. Uh, if we could Brian, could we drop back to the other slide just to make sure that we're given ample time between the slides to uh, to give people the opportunity to get information that they wanted? I'll be quiet for a while, and uh, I'll be still be here. You may not see me on camera, but I will be here uh, monitoring if there's any hand raising or questions, and then I can come back on. Uh, thank you very much for your participation this evening. Uh, just as I say that, there's a question that has come through, so. Let's look at that. Shannon, is there someone at the Department of Interior that you recommend we contact with concerns? Uh, you can contact me and I can forward your concerns depending on what your concerns may be to the appropriate folks. Uh, if you're looking at the Department of Interior, not the Bureau of Land Management, is that what I'm understanding? Uh, that would be up through uh, uh, the, the uh, the director's office and such. So if you could send me your your uh, your request with uh, what you're looking for and concerns, I could point you to the either the headquarters lead or uh, or uh, further than that, uh, if that's what uh, 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 probably the first stop would be either uh, us or then uh, even then maybe the uh, headquarters lead for uh, uh, the BLM's uh, Renewable Energy Program. That would be Jeremy Bluma. Uh, thank you, Shannon. Uh, Amy, uh, thank you for taking our questions. We uh, we feel you have heard us and hopefully you, you might find a way to move forward to a better solution for green energy. That's all better for, uh, that's better for all. But thank you very much, Amy. We try very hard to make sure that we uh, 
uh, we run the most transparent uh, process possible and and uh, supply uh, good customer service back to uh, to the public. Uh, that's what I strongly believe in, and and make sure that uh, that my team is always making sure that uh, that we're being very responsive. Uh, so thank you very much, Amy. Appreciate that. All right, I'll be off camera and uh, on mute. I will come back on if there happens to be a, an action uh, item for me here. Uh, so uh, there'll be a moment of quiet. I see a question from Shannon. Uh, let's see. Uh, EDF did contribute to the presentation on slides six, seven, and eight, and uh, and uh, they are here and present in the meeting uh, to contribute uh, to questions. If you'd like to, uh, they have offered to meet with the communities and such. So if you do send us an email, uh, we'll make sure EDF makes contact with you, Shannon. Uh, I'm unaware of what states they may live in. Uh, Shannon, uh, send us the, your, your question and we'll make sure that Devin and, and uh, Levi uh, uh, can get to you. I, I'd ask them at this time not to present that information. Uh, Greg, can you adjust your volume, your headphone to be a little bit louder? Thank you. Wow, I'm yeah. not even aware that it even made it up that far. I, so, I think... We'll put you in direct contact with them, uh, Shannon. Uh, uh, where they live is is may not be public information for for everyone. So, uh, if they choose to uh, contact you and let you know where they're uh, from, uh, that will be their choice. Uh, but thank you for the question, Shannon.
may have brought up the introduction slide again, uh, Shannon, um, and here are the, uh, here's the information that you're asking. There's some more questions that have popped up into the uh, chat. Uh, Devin or Levi, could you respond with uh, an answer? You could type an answer. Uh, that would be great. There's 20 minutes until the eight o'clock hour. I'm just uh, letting people know of the time. Uh, we will be here for the next 20 minutes. Thank you. Devin, I accidentally uh, closed off the question of what does EDF stand for? Um, if you wanna either put that in the chat or yeah, uh, we could have them do that in the chat, put that in the chat. Uh, they're typing their answers uh, because the meeting is about the variance, not necessarily what the EDF stands for or or uh, or stuff. So we're, we're trying to make sure, Shannon, that we're focused on uh, the variance process here and, and what the project Bonanza project's about. So uh, we'll be responding to you, but there may be some uh, questions that will either be put in chat for everybody to see or they don't necessarily require a, a verbal uh, response, uh, but we are trying to be uh, 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 responsive as possible. So Jonathan, we can move the first question from Shannon forward, please. Uh, the second question is, what is the Bonanza project about? Uh, I'm not familiar with what that question would be. The, the variance process has been defined. Uh, the Bonanza project is a solar project uh, for 300 megawatts of renewable energy. Uh, uh, if you'd like to 
define your question further, please uh, send us an email on that. Uh, we could probably, uh, you might be after what, what the purpose and need statement, which is typical in the, the NEPA document. Uh, sorry for that hiccup. I was trying to drink some water. Uh, that's not part of the variance process. The next question is how does the BLM define renewable energy? Uh, you can send that question to us or to me in an email and, and I can respond uh, uh, to what uh, the BLM's uh, definition is of renewable energy. Thank you for your questions, Shannon. Carl has a question here. Have there been any fires caused by solar panels on BLM sites? Not that I'm aware of, Carl. Uh, the only fire I'm ever aware of that's ever happened was at the Ivanpah where the mirrors were misfocused in the, uh, the tower one or three, I can't remember which one it was, uh, had to be taken out of commission for a little while for it to be repaired. That was on a California site in Nevada. I'm not aware of any uh, fires that have been started by, uh, by uh, uh, solar panels. Uh, Again, Ivan Paw though is different. They're a CSP, concentrated solar power. Uh, TV panels are, I'm not aware of any fires, Carl. Thank you for the question. A little outside of the variance scope, but uh, able to be answered. Thank you. See a question that has come up. Do PV panels lose efficiency when they get over a certain temperature? Uh, there is a temperature issue with solar panels uh, getting too hot, they would lose some efficiency. The energy they're collecting is creating heat. <clears throat> so there is an efficiency, there could be an, a potential efficiency issue. Uh, manufacturers uh, are aware of that and they adjust for that. Uh, I, in the NEPA document, if that's a, uh, a particular question, we could talk about efficiency of solar panels and uh, what their uh, what the requirements of. Would there be battery storage from Shannon again? Would there be battery storage, and would this be re uh, require cooling? Uh, we did mention at the beginning of this presentation that they are planning on battery storage for this specific project of 300 megawatts. In their plan of development, it talks about the battery storage and batteries do get warm, so some form of cooling would be required for the batteries. Um, so that would be in the plan development that's available at the website that Brian uh, uh, presented earlier. Uh, thank you for that question, Shannon. Shannon has another question here. How, how much do you think it might uh, lose in the summer months? Not aware of, of how much it would lose in each individual panel. That's a very scientific, uh, determination. Uh, most of these sites are oversized by just a little bit to make sure that they keep up with the power uh, that they're required to put on on the uh, on the grid. Thank you, Shannon, for that question. And Shannon asks again, what form of cooling would be used? Uh, batteries respond to uh, fans cooling inside of a building. Uh, water is not an is a cooling product that's used for cooling batteries that I'm aware of. Uh, so uh, that would be up to the applicant to uh, clearly articulate 
uh, how they would plan on cooling the batteries if that's necessary with the uh, the type of battery that would be used and how that would be uh, how that would work into the equation. Uh, thank you, Shannon, for that question. Uh, Shannon also is asking here, how would the fans be powered? How much energy would be used? That's stuff that would be supplied in the NEPA document if uh, they're approved to move through to the NEPA document. Uh, fans could be powered by on-site local power and uh, and the amount of energy that's used for a fan would be determined by the size of the fan, uh, unknown. Uh, so Shannon then again asks, what type of battery would be used? Unknown, Shannon, that uh, hasn't been determined yet on the type of battery. There are multiple types of battery out there for use uh, with renewable energy projects. So uh, at the variant stage, that determination hasn't been made other than the fact that they have stated that this project would consist of uh, solar and battery, battery energy storage. So uh, great questions, Shannon. Um, we just uh, we're we're just not at that point yet uh, to to make those uh, to make to 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 state uh, that, and I'd, I'd prefer to stay with the facts. Great question, so thank you, Shannon, very much. And my mic is here, so I'm hoping everybody can hear me just fine. Shannon, thanks for a great meeting. You're very welcome, Shannon. Please uh, email me any further communication you'd like to have with me or my staff, and and we'd be happy to get back to you and uh, and uh, give you the factual information that we can provide. And uh, very much appreciate you participating in this evening's meeting. We have about 10 minutes left, folks. Uh, so if you'd like to uh, get in with 10 minutes to go, we'd appreciate the opportunity to, to be able to uh, to, to uh, hear from you or uh, to answer a question you may have.
I see the Reverend has uh, has a question here. Uh, how much heat is the solar farm going to generate? Will it increase the local area temperature? And is it taken into consideration how it will affect wildlife in the residents? Yes, there have been studies on wildlife versus photovoltaic and the amount of heat, ambient temperature that that uh, that uh, photovoltaic uh, puts out. Uh, I'm not aware of beyond the fence line of any um, excessive amount of heat that is produced. Uh, that is a great topic for the, the NEPA document on, uh, on temperature uh, variances and uh, information on that. So uh, it has been uh, approached before. So uh, thank you very much for that, uh, that question and uh, uh, in the variance process, we do not have that uh, that determination. But great question, thank you. Just want to let folks know we're at 7:55. That's the uh, five-minute uh, call till eight o'clock. Uh, Brian has cleverly placed the uh, slide up here that uh, we are accepting comments uh, to that email address uh, by September 22nd. Uh, comments can also be submitted in writing to uh, the BLM address there being presented for you. Uh, so we've got about five minutes to go until we end this session of the variance. Uh, second meeting process and uh, we'd like to thank you all very much for participating on this Thursday evening. Uh, uh, we'll take it all the way to eight o'clock. So uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll come back at eight.
With a minute to go, I'd like to thank our uh, our uh, panelists this evening, the supporting cast, of the Southern Nevada District, the state office, and uh, our applicant and the contractor, DUDAC, for uh, supporting this. Uh, Karen's chiming, timing in. Thank you for the information, and uh, we'll write in in time. Thank you very much, Karen, uh, for that. Uh, we're in the last few seconds of the meeting here, so thank you, everybody, for the attendees. The 82 questions that have been answered this evening hopefully have been answered appropriately for, appropriately for the folks and uh, always available through uh, email. And uh, if you'd like to ask some additional questions of our team, we can get you the answers. Uh, but thank you very, very much, everyone, on this Thursday evening, taking out the time to uh, to communicate with us. It's 8 o'clock. We'll go ahead and end the presentation, and I hope you have a nice evening. Thank you very much.